So if you're in the book of Philemon, you know from last week, it's a short book, or I should say letter, because it's actually a letter. Paul, once again, recapping, is writing to Philemon, who is a Christian, wealthy Christian slave owner, and Onesimus was his slave who had ran away, and apparently... He took something from Philemon when he did that, and he traveled to Rome where he figured he could blend in with the multitude of other slaves that were there and kind of hide from what he was doing, uh, especially in Rome because Rome had, I think it was 600 million slaves, and so he could blend in easily. But while he was there, we know that he met Paul at some point, got converted, and then became a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, serving Paul. And then apparently Paul finds out that Onesimus was a runaway slave and tells him he needs to go back, he needs to turn himself in. And so Paul decides to write this letter in order to uh, plead with Philemon to forgive Onesimus because technically Onesimus could be put to death for what he did. It was, it was a capital punishment for a slave to run away. And so Paul writes this letter and he butters him up for the first seven verses as we saw. He's reminding him of all his faithfulness as a Christian and all the good deeds that he had done and, and just kind of buttering him up just to make him feel good about himself. Then in verses 8 onward, he begins to share about Onesimus and how he had run away and became unprofitable, but now he is profitable because he's a Christian and he's asking him to pardon him. So then now when we come into verse 17, we see that Paul has already asked him, but then he continues and he says, if then you count me a partner, receive him as you would me. So Paul now says, hey, if you count me a partner, a partner in the faith, a part, it's like having a uh, a partnership within a business, if we are fellow shippers together in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we're partners, he says, then I'm asking you to receive him as you would me. So Paul is making it clear, I'm sending him to you, but I'm asking you to send, when you receive him, receive me. I think this would make it hard for Philemon because he knows this guy ran away from him. He knows he took away of the labor that he could have had from him. And then on top of it, he stole something from him. And, and I'm sure he didn't really like what had happened to him. But Paul's writing, if you remember, Paul was instrumental even in Philemon's life. And he was instrumental in Onesimus' life. So he tells them, receive them. And receive has the idea of bring him into the family. Now that would be tough for a owner to bring in a slave and have him look like one of your family or treat him like one of your family because they're slaves. But Paul was speaking in reference to the Christian family. And that's what happens when we become a part of the Christian family. That's exactly it. We are part of a family. We have a group of people that we support and watch over each other uh we have the blessing here of of you know we all kind of we all kind of act mexican here we we take your kids and we'll slap them for you you know we kind of say hey we're here to watch your kids we're here to help train them now you know i'm just joking but we're not when it comes to our kids we we really like to watch over our kids and all these kids Sometimes I wonder if they're not confused who their parents are. Because we're all involved in their lives. We're all telling them, hey, you can't be doing that. And who are you? You ain't my dad. It doesn't matter. Get off there. You know? Because we care for them. And so we are a family and we treat each other as a family. And so when, when we look at this, Onesimus, or excuse me, Paul is telling Philemon, receive him into this family. Now this is stuff for thought that Philemon has to start to think about. He says, verse 18, but if he had wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Now, Paul's not actually saying he did it. 
He's saying, if he has wronged you or owed you anything, he says, put that on, on my account. In other words, charge me for it. Here's my credit card. Charge me for whatever he's done to you, whatever he owes you, and and I will take care of his debt. So he's given Philemon sort of a way out that he'll pay for whatever the wrong is. Now, we don't know exactly what the wrong was. We just know Paul is offering to supply whatever's needed. And so he's telling Philemon, hey, I'll pay what he owes. Paul is sort of a type here of what Jesus did for us. Remember what Jesus did for us? Jesus paid for our sins the debt that we owed. Isaiah 53, 6 says, For all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity, iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. Romans, remember, uh, 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah here tells us, All of us like sheep have gone astray. In other words, none of us are perfect. We all have problems. There's not a, a person here who... Has, doesn't have something going on in, in their lives. And so, you know, this is a good reason why we shouldn't judge one another. And when we, I look at this verse, I think here we are, we're all have missed the mark. And Paul's telling Philemon, hey, if he owes you anything, he's missed the mark, I'll, I'll pay for it. It's exactly what Jesus did for each and every one of us. He paid our debt for our gone, going astray or because we have all missed the mark and so Paul is just telling Philemon exactly what Jesus did is what I need you to do I need you to forgive in fact in Matthew 6 I'm trying to see it in my brain I, I want to say verse 13 or 14 right after the our father as soon as you get to the our father when it, it says amen it says, and if you will not forgive your brother his sins, neither will I forgive you your sins. It, it really should be added to the Our Father. We, we cut that part off. And there's a condition for every believer that when, when you pray for, to God and ask for your forgiveness of your sin, that we are obligated to forgive the sins of others. And, and the idea is, if we don't, then neither will our sins be forgiven. Read that, Matthew 6, right at the end of the Our Father. It says it very clearly. And so Paul says, if whatever he's done to hey, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hands. I will repay. Now, why is this important? Because Paul always dictated his letters. The letter to Philemon, he says, I am writing it myself. In other words, he's he's... He's in his own writing, writing, and he's pledging within himself, writing not by dictating it to someone. He's actually writing a legal document obligating himself that he would pay later if he needed to. He's co-signing for Onesimus. And he's saying, I'm going to pay this bill. Paul is promising to pay the debt that Onesimus owed. He says, not to mention to you, that you owe me even of your own self besides. Hey, I don't really want to have to bring this up. But really, your salvation came by way of my ministry as well. He says, so not to mention that you owe me even of your own selves beside, because Paul was also used to bring Philemon into the faith. Now, we know it's all Jesus. We know it's all the Holy Spirit. But there are individuals. Do you know who the Lord used in your life? I do. I will never forget those two guys in the L.A. County Jail. Never. I don't know their names. I don't even remember what they looked like. I just know there was two guys. And they were sharing the Lord with each other about tongues. And I walked in and heard this whole thing. Got saved in between. And I'll never forget that conversation and that whole picture of when the Lord worked in my heart 
And really it wasn't even those two guys who helped me get saved. They were just the instrument God used to draw me in because when I got transferred upstairs, it was actually another guy the Lord used in my confusion to reveal to me in the Bible that I needed to be born again. And that's another guy I just won't forget. And so Paul tells Philemon, hey, I really didn't want to mention this to you, but you know what? You really owe me your own self as well. Almost like there's a debt that's there, and I just want you to think about that as well. It was almost like saying, you remember how your life changed when the good news came to you? Do you guys remember where you were before you got saved? You remember the condition you were in before you got saved? And then whoever that individual was that the Lord sent to minister to you, and maybe it was multiple individuals, and, w- and when it happened for real, change came. Right? I mean, it just came. It, it's, it, things begin to change. And Paul's like telling them, man, remember what happened to you. Because what he really wants to say is this is what's happened to Onesimus. He was unprofitable, but his life changed. He's a brother in the Lord now. And you remember what that's like. You remember living for yourself and, and doing, you know, foolish, making foolish decisions. Onesimus did something he shouldn't have done. He ran away as a slave. He stole from you what you had no business doing. But now he's useful both to you and I. You remember that. You owe me your own self beside. You remember who you were. And you know, I think that's a good reminder to all of us to remember who we are, but to remember who we were. I know some people, Christians, that don't want to remember the past. They just want to let it all go and never never talk about it, never do anything. I think they are missing out on the Lord using them in their testimony to encourage someone else who is down and out. Because we're all down and out. Some people are embarrassed. I feel bad for them. Because it really reveals to me that they haven't had the real freedom that they need. Because when you have real freedom, you're able to share. Now, it's not the easiest thing, but it is easier every time you share. Every time I share about my past, you know, sometimes I'll say, hey, listen, I'm not proud of my past, but I, and I'm not ashamed of it either. I'm grateful for what God has taken me out of. I am ashamed that I did those things, but I'm not ashamed to share those things. Because He's greater than anything I've ever done or will do. And He's more powerful than anything I could bring up to you. And besides, the more I know you, the more you're like me. So who am I kidding anyways? Right? Now we're not all to the same depth of past mistakes or judgments or addictions, but we all got something. And that's sort of what Paul was telling Philemon. Hey, by, I don't want to mention this, but man, you owe me yourself too. Don't forget your life. Don't forget who you were. And, and, I, and I, again, I don't believe we, any of us should forget where we were but what we must remember where we're headed right where i was is not as important as where i'm heading now before i was heading to hell didn't know it now i'm heading to heaven heaven and i know it so now there's a different mindset within my mind and within my heart he says yes brother let me have joy Refresh my heart in the Lord. Yes, brother, brother. It's like he's pleading with him. Let me have joy. Joy means let me have the benefit of your decision. Let me have the benefit of the restoration of Onesimus in our lives. And and sometimes we need that. We need to know that someone's okay because of us asking for them and pleading for them. 
He says, refresh my heart. It means give my heart rest. In other words, he's anxious about what is going on. Because see, Paul doesn't know what Philemon is going to do. In fact, we don't know what he actually did. There's nowhere in Scripture that tells us he forgave him, he had him killed. We, We don't know anything. All we know is Paul is asking him to forgive him, to and to refresh his heart, to bring joy to him and refresh his heart. His heart is his bowels. Maybe you have the old King James. It's his bowels. It's it's the soul. It's the deepest part of his being. It says, refresh my heart in the Lord by forgiving Onesimus. Having confidence in your obedience. Paul expected Philemon to be compassionate to Onesimus on his behalf. And I think sometimes we need to have that confidence when we plead for someone else. You know, I was thinking about this last night when I was going over my notes. And I started to think about this letter. And I go, man, this letter is someone pleading on behalf of someone else to forgive the mistakes of someone else. And it reminded me of my life after becoming a Christian. I had been a Christian a couple of years. I was under uh, probation. I had a test every week, sometimes twice a week, for three years. A lot of guys around me were getting kicked off, and I still had a test. I had a call every day, Monday through Friday, and see if the color gold was repeated. And then I'd have to go from Torrance to Long Beach and go give a, a, a UA. Every, every, every day, five days a week, for three years. Never had one dirty test. My life, I was a Christian. I was involved, involved in the drug and alcohol class the whole time. I was at South Bay eight years. Not because I needed it, because I I was helping and I was teaching. And I remember I couldn't drive. I remember, I think it was within six months, I had been driving illegally, taking my chances, driving my truck, justifying I'm going to church. I mean, really, I was justifying I'm going to church. God protect me like he's going to answer a prayer (laughs) that I'm going to break the law just so I can go to church. And finally I got to the conviction where I I thought, you know what, I just can't do this anymore. Either I'm going to obey the law or I'm not. And I decided if it meant riding a bike to go to church, let me tell you, riding a bike from Torrance to Long Beach is a 12-mile ride. It's a long ride when they say gold. That means tomorrow i got to ride 12 miles if I can't get a ride, and I had to ride that ride often. Anyways, about a year and a half had passed, and my license were suspended for 10 years from before that because I had six drunk drivings. So it was right what they did to me. But I found out you could appeal a decision. I have never appealed anything because I've always been guilty and said, just face up to it. You did, you know, Beretta, you don't do the crime if you can't do the time. So I would just do the time. Well, I decided to go before the judge. So I asked Pastor Steve to write me a letter about who I was and attending his church. I asked Henry to write me a letter. He was the guy in charge of the uh, New Heart uh, Drug and Alcohol Ministry. And then I asked my probation officer <laughs> to write me a letter because I had no dirty UAs that, you know, the whole time, but at that time it was about a year and a half or two years. And so I went to the court thing in Long Beach and got before this uh, judge and presented her with all the documents that had letters like this, gave them to her, she asked me a few questions, and she said, you know, you got a lot of good support here. She goes, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people have wrote letters for you. 
and I got to share with her about how I got saved in my life and, you know, what God has done. And, sh and she tells me, you know, I'm a member of the Baptist church. And I believe God wants me to give you a second chance. And she restored my license to me and told me if I ever got a ticket for anything, she's writing a note that they would be taken away the rest of my life. Now, of course, I knew I was going to be okay. But when I, when I read this letter, that's what I think about. Someone saying something on behalf of someone else. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He said something to the Father on behalf of someone else. He said, Lord, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Account their sins on me. See, Jesus sort of wrote the letter for all of us to say, you know what? I need you to forgive them, and I know you will. And Philemon is receiving a letter from Paul on behalf of Onesimus. So we're either Paul's Philemon's or Onesimus. We're either running from something and need help, or we're Paul's that can help someone to make peace with someone, or we're Philemon's who need to forgive someone for what they've done for us. Somewhere we're in these characters, or maybe we're all three at different parts of our lives. Maybe we need to write a letter on behalf of someone who's shown true repentance and have made, you know, there's a change in their lives. Or maybe we're the ones that are running from something and not letting go. Or maybe we're Philemon's who need to just forgive. He says, I write to you knowing that you will even do more than I say. Hey, I know you're going to do more than I ask. Paul tells Philemon, I know you're going to forgive Onesimus. I know you're going to do even more than what I'm asking you to do. Maybe he's not just going to forgive him. Maybe he's going to set him free. I, you know, I don't know. Paul says, I know you, you're going to do more. And for us, when we receive the blood of Christ and the forgiveness, God gives us so much more than just salvation. I, when I used to teach the drug and alcohol class, you know, um, the deal was you could come for three months and you could come for six months, but after that you need to get out there and get busy with whatever else God has for you. See, I went to AA meetings and all the drug support meetings for a lot of years trying to get my sobriety, and every time I went, I was said I had to keep coming. And you can never leave that place, so you have to be an AA for 30 years if you're still around you 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 can't leave this becomes the new addiction but in Christ Jesus he said hey he who is free is free indeed there is no I need to be anywhere so when I took over the drug class I knew the Lord was saying listen I don't want these people coming here and and you starting a whole ministry and build another church within a church Teach them what I want you to teach them. Let me touch them and set them free. And then they got to go on with the rest of the church and get busy learning the other stuff. They need to learn to be good wives or good husbands. They need teachings about being a father and being a mother. How to be a good worker. How to be a good friend. How to get past anger issues or prejudice. And there are parts of the body that you know, we all do a special thing, but other parts they must get involved with. And so when I read this, that's what I think about. That's what God did to us. So it's more than just my salvation. One thing I like to love about God is that he didn't just stop at my sobriety. He goes on to change the whole hoggy. You've heard me say this. Now, if I'm a jerk and I'm an alcoholic or a drug addict, I'm an alcoholic jerk. Now, if I get sober, I'm still a jerk. I'm just a sober jerk, right? Well, God says, no, I don't want you to be any kind of a jerk. So we're going to start with this because this is the main thing. You know, uh, Chad used to say, some of you know Chad, he used to see balls going up and the Lord freezing them and dealing with one ball at a time in his life. 
And it was such a good picture because that's what God does with us. Sometimes we have so many balls we're trying to juggle. He said, you know what? Freeze. Let's, let's deal with this one. And let's deal with this one. And that's kind of what God does. He takes care of the main issue, whatever that issue is. In my life, it was drugs and, and alcohol. But then he dealt with anger and jealousy. And he keeps pulling these balls. And, and I don't know how many are left because I don't know how many were out there. <laughs> but I do know there's less today than there was 32 years ago. Because back then it probably looked like one of those kid things, you know, where all the balls and you jump in and you kind of just have, all, that's the way my life with all these balls. I couldn't even tell. But, but now I'm sure, in, at least in God's eyes, like, man, it's getting light around here. We, we just got these few, you know, if my life dies tomorrow, hey, it's all over. It, my balls are done, man. I will be exactly what he wants me to be. So, I'm writing knowing that you will do even more than I say. And God does more for us than we can ever imagine. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. Paul's saying, you know what, I'm going to come visit. And I'd like you to have a guest room for me. And Christians are supposed to be hospitable. First Timothy 3 says, a bishop, a leader, an elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and able to teach. Now, I realize today's world is a lot tougher to be hospitable, but the idea of hospitality is amongst ourselves, okay? It's not necessarily talking about everyone that's out there. It means within ourselves we should make available room that we have if somebody is in need of one and Paul says I'm in need of a room Philemon, I need you to prepare something for me and and we have good testimonies of the church doing that with people helping people get back on their feet because they need a place to stay and but Paul says hey I'm coming to visit which I think made it tougher on Philemon because he's already sending Onesimus there for him to deal with. But he's also saying, I'm going to be there <laughs> pretty soon myself. I think that would make it tougher. For I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. In other words, he's saying that I trust because you're praying that I'm going to be released from this prison. And upon my release, I'm going to go visit you. And again, prayer, we talked about that last week. It seems to be the instrument that God always works through. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. What do you think everything means? All of it, right? Everything that's going on in your life, whatever's happening, says, By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, ask God for the things that are going on in your life. Come before Him and pray and call out to Him with supplication, with thanksgiving, having a thankful heart. For God supplies all our needs according to what? His riches and His glory. He provides for all our needs. But to the Philippians, Paul says, In everything by prayer, come before God, make your quest be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We are called to be people of prayer. We are called to ask God for whatever it is that we're thinking about or going through and come before Him in prayer. Paul says, I trust that through your prayers, I am going to be released. Again, praying for someone else and their needs and what's happening in their lives. See, we like to pray for us. We want a better job, a better car. We want God to fix our kids. We want God to take us out of debt. We ask God for a lot of things for us. I wonder if we wrote all the things we asked God for, how much of it is us and how much is it for others? I would not be surprised. It's 80, 90% us and 10, 20 for others. 
But yet in the Bible, most of prayer is always others oriented. It's always about the needs of other people. Not that we shouldn't pray for ourselves. We have needs. I mean, the Bible says cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. I have worries. I have things that I go through. I need to bring them before the Lord as well. But more than not, it's, it's you know what? I need to be praying for other people too. What are their needs? What are they going through? Paul says, I trust that through your prayers, I will be granted to you. I will be released. I'm trusting what you're praying is going to bring what I need. Then he tells us to pray for everything. He closes by saying, Epiras uh, or Epipras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, greet you. Now, Epiras was a, a faithful minister in Colossae where Paul is sending this letter. As does Mark. Now, most believe this is speaking of Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You guys remember him. He wrote the book of Mark. Mark appears in the New Testament, always with uh, a prominent people, Paul, Barnabas, people like that. His mother Mary was wealthy. She had servants. The church was in her house praying when Peter was locked up. Paul, Mark had always been around people of faith. Some think it was him that ran out and got the garment when Jesus was walking and pulled back. Mark went on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. He was considered an assistant to them, uh, meaning someone who would help with all the needs of preparing food or lodging and things of that sort. So he was faithful up until a point, but then there came a time when he got to a place when they were going to go visit the churches again that something happened and he abandoned them and left. And then when Paul and Barnabas were going to go on their second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark with them. And Paul said, no, the guy, the guy flaked out on us. We're not taking him. And it got so bad that there was a, a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, and they split. And Paul took Silas with him and went on a mission trip. Barnabas took Mark and went back home. And Barnabas and Mark, you know, they're cousins, so he was standing behind his cousin, but his cousin did abandon them during the, the ministry and walked away. And it wasn't until years later, years later, I think it's 10 15 years later, that Paul asked for Mark to come and said he would be a benefit to them. So whatever Mark did, besides the abandonment of leaving them while in ministry, it didn't sit well with Paul. But here Paul is adds him to the greeting of his name, of uh, someone who uh, he attributes you know, the greeting to. And so we see Mark here came back and was faithful. Aristarchus uh, was from Thessalonica. Demas, we know also, was a fellow worker, but he fell later, loving the present world, Paul wrote. He walked away. Luke, the physician, wrote the book of Luke and Acts. My fellow laborers, he's, he says. These are all the men Paul writes about who these guys were and their, and their fellowship. No. Demas at the time was still loyal. He hadn't walked away yet. And it's funny because when we look at the church today, we see this. In fact, the Lord said, when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? I think we're going to see more of this type of people where people abandon ministry and people go back to the love of this world and desire the things of this world and the things of God are no longer important anymore. It's like the, the parable that Jesus talked about the seed and some seed fell on stony ground and, you know, this ground and, and that ground. And many of our lives, seeds are being planted, but, you know, the cares of the world choke out the word. So if we're worried about our bills and things of life and it chokes out the word, it, we, we become weak Christians. 
and life's pleasures come in and choke out the word. But the seed that's on fertile ground takes root and grows and becomes strong. And God works through that type of seed. But I have a funny feeling in these last days, we're, we're going to see the mixture of all this. We see it already now. People falling away from the church. People, they're back doing what they did before they became saved. They're micromanaging or whatever. You wish, I'm thinking of another word. You know, our houses. I, and I'm not saying we should have a messy house. I believe Christians should have a really nice house. But that's all they spend their time on is their house. There's no witnessing. There's no sharing about the gospel. It's all about maintaining their houses and, and earning their cars and, and on and on and on. And, and it's the pleasures of this world. But we don't go out. It's like here. We have ministry taking place. We started Sunday because a few want it more and we want to feed them, but I'm not so sure that's the best idea. I've been wrestling with that the last couple of weeks. Why? Because when are we going to go out and bring in a harvest? The harvest ought to dictate that we need more, not that we should continue to, to offer desserts and you know things in ministry. Ministry ought to grow because more people are coming and there's more need. These are the things I struggle with as a pastor. These are the things I pray about. Lord, when are we going to let you or watch you bring in people so ministry will bring in people? Because we live in a terrible time right now. There are people struggling with addictions, heroin and meth and alcohol. There's homelessness. I know there's some great stuff happening with homelessness, and I know there's a lot of baloney with homelessness. It's like the guy that came here the other day. He, you know, he came to see me and tells me he chooses to be homeless. He chooses to take advantage of people, is what he told me. Because if you're not going to work and provide for yourself and sponge off people, then you're choosing to take advantage of other people's blessings to provide for yourself. I have trouble helping someone like that. Someone who's down and out and really is homeless for because of tragedy in their life and stuff or mental illness, you know, I have great compassion for that. So it's a hard balance. So it's praying, Lord, how do we engage in a world that we live in today that seems to be falling apart? And and I know these Paul ends with these guys and some left for the world, some abandoned, some came back, others are faithful. And I have to ask myself, Lord, help my heart. Help me in what you're doing in my life. Keep me faithful. Keep me tender. I don't want to be hard towards people either. I want to have compassion I want to do what Pastor Chuck taught us if you're going to err err on the side of grace err for doing the right thing they take advantage of you err because you did the right thing keep your heart tender keep focus on God be be Paul who writes on behalf be Onesimus who needs forgiveness or be Philemon who needs to let go but as a church, we need to practice what we're called here to do in whatever place we might be. Because we live in a world that needs all of this. Some of your family members need your forgiveness. It's been way too long that you have not talked to them. Go to the cross. Crucify yourself and say, hey, I'm sorry. Even if it's not your fault, I'm sorry. This isn't worth it. I, I want a relationship with you. I got to be Philemon. I got to let go. Yeah, I was taken advantage of. Yeah, they, they robbed me. They did whatever. Now, it's been a while. Some of you know I love people's court. I don't get to watch it as much as I like to. 
But I'm always away, amazed that people stop talking to each other for $50, $100. I'm just amazed. Family. Nope, not my friend no more. That's what they walk out. They're not my friend no more. It's over. For 50 bucks? 25 year relationship is over for 50 bucks? I think, man, where's our hearts, Lord? What's going on with America? Where where are we headed? The other day I I was sitting there thinking about all this stuff with the voting and I go, God, please help us. Help us. I think for the first time I realized how bad a shape we really are. I, I didn't think of us being in really bad shape. But the other day I... I sense, Lord, we're in, we're, we need you. We need your help right now. This, this whole thing is crazy. You need to help us stay focused on you because your plan is going to be carried out. I don't care who's in office. Your plan in the Bible already talked about where we're headed, where we will be when it comes in relationship to Israel. And that the world will be against her. And whoever wins is not going to change that. Because God's plan has already been written out. But our love for them. And how we can minister to them. And, and present the gospel to them. Should always be the focus of it all. So I... I believe we need to be praying in these days like never before. I, I believe we need to be calling out on God on behalf of people, like Paul writing to Philemon, calling out to God, writing something for someone if we can, being available, encouraging forgiveness, try to keep things Calm as best we can. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's what we're called to be, peacemakers. That's what Paul was doing. He was trying to make peace. Amen?